You are listening to the Mary Jane Society podcast, where you will meet entrepreneurs, cultivators, inventors, creators, and leaders in the cannabis industry. I'm your host, Pam Schmiel, marketing and publicist in the cannabis industry. Today we meet Franny Tassie. She's laying the groundwork in Asheville, North Carolina for when the state turns wreck. She began as a hemp farmer, added a 420-friendly B&B to her property, opened a handful of CBD stores, started a franchise that spans multiple states, and has a line of hemp-based pasta she can't keep on the shelves. Franny is a smart and strategic businesswoman shaping the cannabis industry in North Carolina. Let's meet Franny. Hi, Franny. How are you? Hi. So you're based in North Carolina, right? Asheville, North Carolina. Asheville. That's so cool. I um I actually my I w- went with my family to Asheville, and I and I had read that Asheville was like a foodie town, and uh, yeah, we spent one or two nights there and hiked up in the Blue Ridge Mountains, right? Yeah, it was great. It was really cute. But little next time you come to Asheville. You need to look at Franny's farm and stay here because this is the heart and soul of our business. I have, I was in pharmaceuticals and I was having a fit. I was like, this is the unhealth care industry. That was my corporate career. And I bought a farm and I said, pharma to farm. So three years it took me of waking up every morning and pulling chickens and building a house before I could quit my job. Really? Oh, so it's so your whole business is on is, is well, you, you it's based on a farm. Is it is it a B and B or it is? So it's an agritourism farm. Now that's the heart and soul. People get really confused. I speak all over the country about all sorts of things like entrepreneurship, business. I've had sold forty one pieces of property and had a development. I am I have had so many businesses. I'm a businesswoman. But people know me as the first female farmer that planted him because on my farm, I didn't even know until nine months. I had planted, harvested everything until I got awards. And I was like, I was the first. How did that happen? Really? Uh, mm -hmm. That's so what do you, so that's amazing. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. You know, there's a, there's a similar, it's it's very funny. I interviewed someone, one, one of the first, uh, people I interviewed uh, was it's similar. Uh, wait a second. She's a hemp farmer. You know, you guys might be around the same time. Finger Fingerboard Farms in Maryland. Do you know? I know with Fingerboard Farms. Yes. Uh, I, I forgot her name. Um, Dawn. Dawn. Um, I forgot. But anyway, she's left. I forgot where she was in her career, but she has a, a little B&B, like an upscale B&B farm hemp uh you know cultivating and products and all that kind of stuff well we don't do much cultivation here I had to close my farm down when I started growing hemp and then so now we have a hemp garden with the hemp history tour you can ask Alexa or Google who is Franny Tacey for a lot of fun they'll introduce me (laughs) um as the first female farmer to plant hemp but our farm is really famous for goat yoga and okay what the heck is goat yoga I it is just that. yoga what? with goats I mean they're so bouncy and so much fun they jump all over you it is hysterical it is joy you know the Dalai Lama says the shortest path to happiness is laughter and so that's that's what it's all about I mean it's that's amazing I have heard about that and you know it, but I never was able to kind of hone in on what it really is. So you're actually doing yoga with goats. Yeah. And they jump on your back. And if you do a warrior pose, they'll like run through your legs, chase a cheese ball. Um, So it's really interesting because the farm is what makes people feel good. And that's really why I'm still in business. And we have had, we do a lot of different events here as well. We have a group of herbalists that grows and curates all the botanicals for our tea blends. Mm -hmm. So when we put the farm, F-A-R-M, in pharmacy, I have a lot of products that actually come from our farm. We even have a food truck, farm to food truck, where we sell our hemp 
pasta. And there's no CBD or THC in this. This is like farming has been my hobby my entire life because my dad was a farmer. Mm. My mom, corporate businesswoman. Somehow I got the best of both worlds. <laughs> yeah. now, neither one of my sisters has a damn thing to do with growing anything. Uh, where is North Carolina? I mean, has hemp always been legal in North Carolina? No, it had to be the 2008. Well, we were the fifth state to come online okay. and get industrial hemp pilot program approved, but we were the third state in the country to grow industrial hemp. Okay, because I know, and that's working through universities, agricultural. Um, uh, yep. Yeah, we okay. have to do a lot of stuff. And North Carolina was the only state. So I was involved. My COO was also involved. That's how I met him and started recruiting him. Like, I need you in my business. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I've recruited all our people too. It's so funny. They're like, oh, yeah. You know, we have all these capital investors that come in and meet the team. They're like, how'd you come on Franny's? So they're like, well, she harassed me for a year. Some people are like, for five years. She kept saying, you're the person. When you're ready, I'm ready. If we could just start out with, yeah, you know, what is Franny's Pharmacy? You're saying it started with you were hemp farming and producing the products and how you, is that how it first started or you just jumped to producing CBD products? No, the first year I grew for food and fiber. Okay. And the second year, I, I'm a businesswoman, right? But I just did it for fun. I'm the one that moved the whole industrial hemp pilot program. And then I had nobody to, to plant the stuff. Mm. I was out searching like you wouldn't believe. I'm like, there needs to be a woman doing this. I contacted every woman farmer and I know them all. Nobody would do it. That's why I did it. Mm. <laughs> so. mm. and, and then the next year pivot, I'm a businesswoman. This is when CBD came on board. Okay. And so by the next year, I planted CBD, opened the first dispensary. I came from manufacturing. We were already making our own products before I ever even planted hemp. I've been making salves for 30 years. So is um so is industrial hemp different from uh consumable, you know, CBD hemp? Or you know, it really isn't, but now in order to help the vernacular for industrial hemp now really refers to the fiber variety, which is for textiles and building materials. So that's how people refer to industrial hemp. So I did grow for food and fiber the first year. I had already had a, a food business for like 10 years, you know, so this next year being a businesswoman, I pivoted. Okay, so it's the way way you grow it. It's not the seeds themselves. Is that it? Or it's the way you extract it? Um, industrial hemp, this is, there's like 300 different varieties of hemp. And so it's all the same. It's kind of like saying, well, is this a russet potato or a new potato? So in a, hemp, the female plant is the medicinal plant. It's big and bushy and has all the flowers and is the medicine. And the male plant that grows tall and straight, it has fewer leaves and buds and has all the seeds. And from the seeds is where we get our food. And from that tall, narrow stalk is where we get the fiber. But uh, there's not, you don't want to be smoking that stuff. It's got mm -hmm. low THC, full of seeds. I mean, that's the swag we were smoking back in the 80s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then in ancient times, this is something good to just remember is that men did all the planting. So like through the a lot of the tribal history, but once they harvested that plant, it went straight to women and the men could not no longer even touch it as it was being transitioned into the medicine because it's a female plant. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, well the and same- now who do we have running our medicine? All men. Mm. Well, I guess you would know coming from the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> yeah. Then how did Franny's pharmacy start in CBD? So that was, I started Franny's pharmacy that first year I grew with the plant. I mean, I, I shifted pretty quick. So the next year we grew and we opened a dispensary and manufacturing and everything. As soon as I got in, it was like, you know, follow the money, where's the opportunity, 
Yeah, everybody was right. The, the CBD, like, th how, when was that? What year was that? That was in 2018. Oh, okay. So 2017, I grew for food and fiber. 2018, I grew for CBD, opened the first dispensary. 2019, opened a second dispensary, distribution and manufacturing. Third dispensary, opened a third dispensary and then started franchising. So uh, now I have 11 dispensaries in six states. Okay. Yeah. I, I can't wait to hear about that because I, I am such a uh, advocate of franchising um, in this industry um, for uh, many reasons. So, so now, okay. So you started doing all that and you were extracting and creating your own products and um, is, is, and then you decided not to grow anymore. So you're just, are you, you're buying the, the concentrator just so out? That first year I involved, started a women in hemp nonprofit, got those seeds since I couldn't find other people to do it. I separated those into two research programs with NC State and put everything under the NC State research project. So I grew for four years, but we had to close my farm down because of all the traffic and I was getting stalked and harassed. And yeah, I had people, well, well, oh, it was, and I had to close my farm, which is an agritourism farm. So I moved all grown. We have a hemp history garden. But my growers, we still have a network of growers. They're all in research. I'm not touching the plant mm -hmm. anymore, but we have our growers that do. What I love about franchises, um, I, I, you know, is because I feel like in the cannabis industry, especially in the, you know, the, the marijuana end of it, um, there's so many new entrepreneurs out there that they really need a franchise model, handholding model. I think it's so perfect for this industry. So, so now you're outsourcing your products being made. Are they being white labeled? No, we, no, we manufacture our products. Okay. We white label for other companies. Okay. We have our own manufacturing, our own distribution. So the way we remain relevant in a business that's seen three great calls. So from the people that started when I did, there's less than 3% of them that are still open. Mm -hmm. So I have seen every single call. We were the first, then we received a shelf hemp and health. Then we were a woman owned health and wellness brand. And now we're putting the farm in pharmacy. So I'm reviving the farm, bringing it back to life, welcoming visitors, having events, doing health and wellness retreats here. We're 420 friendly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm finding in my own world that a lot of um, people are going crazy over CBD topicals, all different types of topicals. I think that seems to be like the real lion it's share. One of our number one top selling products and the most subscription ordered products are yeah. our topicals because once when somebody's in pain, they'll, you'll do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, people are like, I'll take opioids to be not in pain and nobody wants to really do that. So that is like one of the number one reasons. And we see, this is also interesting. Franny's is, we are a convergence brand. We have um, several different licenses out. We will be transitioning and integrating medical and recreational as that comes on. I was going to ask um, you if you do it. We see a real, there's some real issues right now. The National Chiropractic Board just said that they're, their chiropractors can no longer sell CBD, refer it. Yeah, this just came out yesterday. They are going after the money. Yeah. They're going after the money and they want medical and pharmaceuticals wants everything because this is the new era of medicine. We so, have two of our franchise owners are actually pharmacists. That's the thing is we've got to get the education out there about it. But my mother-in-law swears by that uh, topical works for her neuropathy. I've heard yep. it from a couple of people. So I think that's going to be the, you know, entrance into winning people over for CBD because, you know, uh, you know, taking it, ingesting it, it, it's almost like a nutraceutical. You have to really understand what it's doing to your body. I feel like this, there's still so much we need to develop in, in the way of, 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 you know, ingesting CBD. And, and yeah, well, in 2017, when I planted, there was THC and CBD. Now yeah. we have all these other minor cannabinoids 
Yeah. That there's just one after another, after another. Nobody ever even knew Delta 8 was not even on the radar. CBN had not been discovered as a sleep cannabinoid. Right. So are, are you producing any Delta 8 or the Delta 9 products? I just heard a lot of CBD companies. That's how, you know, they've been surviving. And you hear about this only because states are, you know. Well, there's a lot of companies that are just Delta 8 and Delta, Delta 8 companies. They came on just like anybody. They're like, that's the money we're getting in. They specialize in that product, nothing else. Mm. They're not going to be around long. Mm -hmm. everybody wants the delta eight right now and there's a lot of cannibalization within our own industry to get their hands everybody wants that it is i mean it's part of our portfolio um and we do what makes us different we are 100 compliant with all the strictest laws because we operate in multi multiple states so all our packaging is like according to thc the strictest laws all our all our THC is derived from hemp and less than 0.3. So it's legal. So we may have, we only, we're only operating legal at Franny's. Most of it's synthetic coming from China. It has heavy metals. It is not a health and wellness product, but we also see straight up in uh, most products out there. I always challenge everybody. If it says colors or flavors in the ingredients, don't buy it. And FDA came out with oh. some a research, um, what did they call it? An anecdotal research that's looking at over almost 70% of all gummies out there have artificial colors, flavors, and sugar in them. You're saying a lot of it's being produced in China? Oh, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> well, I think everything it's at the gas station, it's so cheap. Right. No. But, you know, the lobbyists for convenience stores. I don't know if people can even begin to fathom the power that the convenience store has. The huge lobbying group. Oh, and and you're saying they're 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 and they want CBD and they want it cheap and they don't want it regulated because oh, it's about to go out. People just buy it. They hear it. They buy it. They're in the store. It's never a repeat customer. They they don't care. Right, right, right. It's never a repeat customer. And but people, I, I think it's more popular in states that are not legal yet. So wh where does um where does North Carolina stand do you think on legalizing THC? Do you, I mean you don't really hear it in the news. I feel like they're not that close. It's in the news. It's on my feed. That's the only place I'll keep people abreast to it. It's not the hottest thing in the the world of CBD, but we're going there and North Carolina will lead the way in the south. We already have since the beginning. Right. So and it's coming and Franny's is right in line. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're well positioned. Yeah. That that's great. Well, I would love to know in the world of the C in CBD, who are most of your customers? What, what, what's the demographic? Are they younger, older? Do you, we or, have a really interesting mix. It is oftentimes um, location dependent. So there's different top selling products in different markets. Like in Hendersonville, we have a large veterans market mm -hmm. just because there's a VA close by and a lot of them live there. Same in Augusta. Um, in our Asheville, we have a lot of tourists. We have a lot of young people. And so we see this huge kind of recreational. We're about 50-50 in Asheville because I came from pharmaceuticals. Every doctor in this town sends them to me. They're like, go see Franny go see Franny. So we have straight up about half of them are all 45 to 65. Okay. Right. That's and what then I'm... we've got this really strong, vibrant, you know, traveling. They're the, the hip people that are really looking in it, you know, all the opportunities, they'll try anything very open. And that's like that later 20s to early 30s we have a huge category of those people as well and we do a lot of other workshops and education uh so we have mushroom workshops and herbal workshops and Ooh. a lot of interesting things that that bring in that younger demographic too mm -hmm. right mushrooms and then athens is in a college town so they're looking they're like 35 and younger but when we look at you know, retail is a huge indicator 
of one market, but e-com is a completely different market. So you've got the really young people there that that is where there is like social media, all our, our sales that come through social channels are a young demographic. Then people that go through email is an older demographic. So it's very interesting. It depends on the way you're marketing. And so we're pretty well striated across, you know, mm -hmm. 28 to 65. Mm -hmm. How, what do you think attributes these uh, franchises, your fr franchisees, franchisees, it to stay in business when a lot of CBD companies, you know, are having struggling, staying alive, you know, staying relevant. And what other states are they in? So you have three in North Carolina, which are yours, right? And then you have. So we're, we're licensed in many, many states and we have operated um, dispensaries, either through a corporate or a franchise model, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida opens in the next couple of weeks, uh, Virginia and Connecticut. Great question about why do people want to do that in light of everything going on? Well, we put the farm in pharmacy. So it is a really a health and wellness, very classy place for people to be able to go in. It's not like a smoke shop. And then they can be guaranteed safety. And our bud tenders are so well trained between Tricom Institute, um, all our onboarding and training that continues that a lot of people are coming in to actually have real conversations about their needs. The number one things that people come in for are sleep, anxiety, pain, and then fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so when they're coming in for fun, they're usually pretty good with that. They're like, I want some drinks and I need some chocolate bars and smokables. And then there's this other population, you know, THCV hit the market and it came out in Europe as an appetite suppressant, you know, and energy. They call it the weederol. Well, we had a lot of people that want to come in and they want to talk to us more about that. What do you know about that? How? Do, and because we can't say everything, it's important for them to come in because we have reference books. Everything we do, we have to reference. We are not physicians. We can't prescribe. Right. Very big on that since I came from pharmaceuticals. Yes, yes, right, right. So yep. THCV, you're saying is is that right? THCV. That's that's the, yeah. So that's the, is it a molecule before it 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 gets decarboxylated? Is that right? Is that the same as in in smoking marijuana? It has to be decarboxylated before it activates. Is THC the? Or... THCV is extracted and then put back into the product. It's a distillate that you put back into the product. So when you extract things, you can take all these, they call them isolates. Mm -hmm. They'll isolate out the THC, the CBD, the THCV, all these different compounds. That's why everybody's doing synthetic D8 because D8 to get that naturally is so tiny right. that you have to have major, major quantities. So that's their thing. They're like, you can't get it naturally. Well, yeah, you can and I think is it the th is is it the the benefit of THCVA is it it's it's potency is that is that why everybody's and so... that's one that's a smokable yeah it's a smokable oh. THCA when it decarboxylate when you smoke it and heat it up and it decarbs then it changes right but nothing about not not a, a, a psychoactive really right because it it can't get above 0.3 THC right. It's, it is not above 0.3 THC when you smoke it. Okay, okay. When you fire it up and decarb it, it changes the, the structure. Okay, okay. And um, so do you find people are, why would you smoke hemp if you're, if you're not getting any sort of psychoactive uh, results? Is it the health benefits? That well, smoking, just like cigarettes, Okay, so right? like, you don't get psychoactive okay. effects from cigarettes, but it does have a calming effect because it crosses the blood brain barrier so instantly. So that's why people like smoke is to to immediately. That's why vapes are so popular and everything you can be driving. I'm not a big smoker or something, but if you're going to put me in New York City driving, 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, give me a bait, please. Yeah. <laughs> or I can say focused and not. Yeah, you've got to be, yeah, driving here. It's, it's a whole, it's a whole experience for sure. <laughs> um, so do you have to have special permits for them? I mean, they get their regular license and they have your franchising agreement with you. Is there, are there any other special um, state licenses or requirements like we have? You Everything know? is different. Yeah. So I'm very famously known for saying this is not business as usual. You don't bank, you don't do credit card processing. It's not your normal licenses. You're not going to be able to find the right bank a lot of times unless you're affiliated. I mean, that's a big, a big thing in some of the states. The only reason they can even get banking is because they're affiliated with us as a corporate franchise. Um, everything is different. Every state is different. This is why when we look at regulation and legalization, it is so much more costly to do business that operates oh, right. every state differently. So you think even about an e-com business, most of them are running completely illegally. They're shipping stuff to places. It's not legal. We don't do that. It's I, different. Thought, I thought you could, every state. I thought you could ship CBD cr across state lines. You, you CBD, you can, but oh. not Delta Eight. There's certain Delta Nine products. Oh, Idaho, oh. you're not getting anything in Idaho. Iowa is not has not been super friendly. Then you'll have Texas that's been horrible to get in, and then all of a sudden they're like, "We lifted all the regulations. Now we're going to put them back in place." Oh. It, you know, it's a moving target. Yes. As these states come on board, that's why you have to have a professional team backed up by a lot of software systems. I mean, it is very, very, um, it's very comprehensive. I've had many, many businesses and there has been nothing like cannabis. <laughs> right, right. But, but coming from pharmaceutical, you're kind of already, you know, programmed for that kind of uh, regulations and compliance you know, that you have to follow. So it, it once, um, say once you turn over, you know, flip over to THC business model in North Carolina, how will that affect your franchise model? Or you'll just have to do a whole new license. It'll have to be a whole new thing. And will, will you be working? We shall see my friend. We shall see. I mean, the, all that happens before they issue the license. You have to be vertically integrated. Each state is different. Every single state. So we have licenses out in multiple states. The entire application process and what is required is different. So it's not like you can go out and apply for a license. If you want to, you have got, it is, there's no form to go out and say, oh, I want to get a license. Right, right, right. Because I've seen, I've there are a couple, uh, you know, marijuana uh, franchises out there, but there's not a lot of information on it because I, it's probably just so difficult going state to state for them to do that. I, I don't even know how they would do that. It's not an option. I, I mean, yeah. I mean it gonna... is, we've been in the process for two years. We're in the process in North Carolina and it'll be another two years. Mm. It is a long process and it yeah. is not, you can't research it and figure out how to do it. You've got to be affiliated. Right, right. These are big. I mean, the, the rules, regulations for everything from growing, manufacturing, distribution, how they're integrated. You, you have to have your retail and MSOs. It is, it takes a lot of people, a lot of money and patience. Right. Because so we're doing something that's never been done before. Right. And so I can kind of see now how you are making it where like you were saying earlier, or a lot of these CBD companies are folding because you are, don't have all your eggs in one basket. You are diversifying with all these other things that you're doing to keep things moving until you step into the THC world, it seems like. That's how you're able to keep it moving. Yeah, uh, and the farm is one of our biggest wholesale accounts because people want to come stay on the farm, walk through a hemp garden, see pigs, do some goat yoga, yeah. and buy things. Right, 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 right. Um, so what about the, are you, I would imagine keeping up on the latest um, science and uh, research on CBD, you know, we were talking about earlier, like advancements or 
what do you see for the future of CBD? Just that it's going to take a long time to really. Well, I like to be breaking constructs. I've been doing it my whole life. I didn't really know. And I didn't really start owning that and moving into my power until much later in life, maybe my fifties. And so what is happening right now is not, I mean, what are you talking about even in the future, two years or 10 years? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, this is one plant and we are the ones that are segmenting it into all these different little categories. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, at one point, pharmaceuticals is going to take over medical. That is more and more research. Every pharmaceutical company is in it. That was my passion is, was in manufacturing and R and D. So they will eventually figure out in pharmaceuticals, how to customize and make all these one-to-one ratios as all these new cannabinoids come out and what's good for all these things. And they will become prescriptions, creational. And that's where we're going to end up. Because the fact that a plant that is a weed is regulated that we can't grow, everybody's going to be able to grow. It'll all change. It'll be destigmatized. We're going to see fiber, food, hemp was what this country was founded on. And it was propaganda that criminalized it. Yeah. And people are waking up. The next generation is not going to have this. That's right. So we've had a long haul, a lot of changes in the future. And right now, who knows in 2024, if we're going to expect big changes and to see this on the platform. Plant medicine in all realms of life is becoming the new healthcare. Yes. Yes, I agree. So we want people, we want people taking their health as a concern and into their own hands. Right, right. We really do. And this is a way, I mean, it's just, it helps with so many different things. And it is a gateway to open up opportunities for a whole bunch of other plant medicine to become more normalized. Right. I And, you know, you do see research coming out almost every day. Finally, you know, there's research. I just read something today about jazz pharmaceuticals, um, testing doing testing on brain tumor but like that they really have some pretty good uh, results already um which is amazing uh, you know that that's i mean amazing so, so cannabis has been more researched and studied more than any other in all pharmaceuticals combined it's european studies yes in america we do not allow european studies to be used as a basis for prescribing or in our textbooks, anything, you have to go and research that. So it's out there. A lot of what's happening is like, they're taking some of this anecdotal studies, putting them through the U S and the seven phase trials. And it takes years and tons. I mean, millions upon millions of dollars to conduct these trials. So we're doing that here, but it is very, very well researched. Right. 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 researched and it there's more and more coming along it's just the research can't catch up with it because they find these new cannabinoids and they're like right if you've got 100 million invested in four years of a trial right now you're not gonna you can't change it so everything on the medical side is going to be catching up catching up we the people have to drive this industry in so many ways and we the people have become a slave population we want our, our food, our air, our water is poison. We want the government to make our decisions and give us the money and bail us out. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's time for us to be empowered. Mm-hmm. And it starts with ourselves, you know. So people are really starting to do this with healthcare. It's gotten so expensive, so unaccessible. And insurance companies, it's a crime. And pharmaceuticals, when I started, I remember when Blue Cross Blue Shield was a nonprofit. We had Sisters of Mercy and all these nonprofits that help take care of our people. And then when it became privatized, there is only one way insurance makes money. Charge more, pay less. And they are in our top corporate, top money generating, prosperous, thriving businesses. Mm-hmm. And then we all say we have issues with healthcare. 
Right, right. It's your own hands. Right, right. A right. lot of it is cardiovascular disease and diabetes, which are controlled a lot of it through our actions. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, we want to eat unhealthy and then take a pill. We're moving out of that. That's really more my mom's generation. When I was in pharmaceuticals, they called me a drug a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, like, yeah. Right, right. And well, so people are looking for other alternatives because we're finding out pharmaceuticals. It's not healing. Mm -hmm. It's just masking. Yeah, Band-Aids. For oh. the most part. Right, right. Antidepressants don't help you with depression. They block the receptor so you don't feel anything and it rewires your brain. So um, I guess um, maybe leading into the, the last question, um, what do you think the, um, why do you think industrial hemp hasn't taken off more? Who's stopping that? I mean, why do it's we our system? I'm still deeply involved in that, but it hasn't caught up. So when I talk about business all the time, I was like, we see the CBD curve and then behind it comes fiber and food and it's uh, textiles. All our textile mills, North Carolina is the textile hub before we moved everything out of the country, all designed for short fibers like co cotton. So you put a long fibrous, it, and we don't have any of the equipment that is designed to be able to process this. So we have some of the most astounding research and we're re really leading the way in textiles through NC State, um, through TS Design, some of the research and some of the fabric people here. Um, also, it is not profitable right now for farmers to grow. So at one point it was, we saw a lot of farmers growing and then the government decided that they were going to reinstitute subsidies for corn and soy. This is when the government said, okay, corn and soy farmers, we're not going to pay you anymore. A whole mass part of them, they were like, then we're growing hemp. You know, what do farmers do? Right. Then they grew all this hemp. A lot of it, it became unusable. Nobody knew what they were going to do with it. You know, our food, it's very interesting as well, because you have to have a lot, a lot, a lot of it to make it viable. So the demand has to be there as well. So it's all people catching up. But I'm so glad you asked because the food is something that I've been, I've had a food business for um, over a decade, a little bit over a decade, Franny's Farm Foods. Okay. We're one of the few people that can even get hemp flour, F-L-O-U-R. It's, you can't find it in the grocery stores. It's $60 a pound. Nobody is buying that, right? Right. And there's not enough farmers growing it. So there's only some of us that have access to that. Oh. So nutritious and delicious. It's absolutely crazy. We have a hemp pasta. We can never keep it in stock. People, grocery stores have asked for it for over a year since we launched it. And we're like, I can't make it and sell it to you cheap enough to have it in your grocery store when I'm selling out every week you know just to keep up with the production so it's all found in our stores but 20 to 25 grams of protein in one serving which is like one ounce so it's more than meat it's a globular protein so easily bioavailable and digestible versus a fiber protein you know the meat protein mm -hmm. and um, it feels good it's an anti-inflammatory in your gut so I say easy in easy out you know, especially uh -huh. in pasta. Yeah. So um, we have cookies, all these things, delicious, and they taste so good. And everything we do is like gluten-free, vegan, and this is all based on the food side of it. So at what point do we follow the rabbit hole of why is it not more popular right now? People right. want it. We can't produce it and nobody's going to give us you can't get government loans or grants or any of this type of stuff for this. So it is me that has to fund it. Well, right. That's not worth money right now. It will be at some point. Right. And, but what about hempcrete? I mean, why aren't we using hempcrete for building and, you know, we are, we are, it's, we are. It's, okay. it's just, you know, I had over 30,000 people on my Franny's Farm website when we did a hempcrete building workshop. I have blog posts, all the stuff that we have done. Mm -hmm. They shut us down. 
took away and I have never regained that. That's 30,000 people that were interested when we did a hemp creek building workshop really? and we were winnowing seeds and we were breaking fiber and showing people all sorts of stuff. They shut it down and I had to rebuild that. And it's, and then COVID came. Mm-hmm. So there was, all, and we had, to, you know, the farm shut down for a while. We had a lot of, a lot of attention here. Close it to the public for a while. If anybody's interested in really learning like what hemp is about, I was the first person in the country to do a t- TED talk on hemp. Mm-hmm. It had always been marijuana growing, THC, medical stuff. So Franny on TED, if I know Franny on TED, you can really find out the history and what the opportunities are. And it's just so amazing to be a facilitator and a connector in this industry because the industry needs everybody. So my friends that have been in the medical field are now taking cannabis nursing lessons so that they can help people. Our accountants now know of cannabis. Our attorneys are in cannabis. Our marketing professionals, there is room for this in every single industry. Conversational for people that even know what's going on is the current industry, the change, the future of the industry. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Wow, that's a good place to end, actually. All right, wow, really, really a pleasure to meet you. You too, thank you so much. I hope you have a great holiday weekend.